second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 2. Today, I am titling the message, Serving God Rather Than Fears or Failures. And today as we come into this, uh, D.L. Moody, an evangelist, uh, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, and uh, was greatly used of the Lord back in the 1800s, and he said something that was very apropos. Speaking of Moses, he said of Moses, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was a somebody. He spent his second 40 years learning he was a nobody. He spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Today, as we come in, I want us to see what God can do with us. That we would think much of him. That he would be the center of our attention. Moses, you know, was born a Jew. He was supposed to be killed at birth. Under the decree, the law, anti-Semitic laws of Pharaoh at the time. Because Pharaoh was afraid in Exodus chapter 1. That these Jewish people were too numerous. And they were going to overtake the nation. And there would be too much competition. So just kill the baby boys. But God used irony. Who is God going to save the life of Moses? He's going to use Pharaoh's own daughter to save. What a turnaround. What an irony that God uses Pharaoh's own daughter to do this. But you will remember that Moses has Jewish roots. Will that get him in trouble? Will he go back with interest and curiosity? Last week we asked that God, uh, we, we asked the question, is God faithful in the silence? Chapter 1 showed, yes, God is very active, even when he seems silent. So when silence is unknown, the silence of the unknown gets to you, what do you need to do? What do you need to do when silence is pestering you? Because you don't know what's going to happen next. Today, I uh, have a very simple proposition for you that I think we can take from these first few chapters of Exodus. Who God is as our deliverer should cause you to respond to him with obedient service. You see, the theme of Exodus is he is our deliverer. And he is the deliverer of the Jewish people. And we need to worship our God as deliverer. And what do we do? We need to see him as that. Who he is. He is a God of salvation. And I should respond with saying, God, if you're so good to deliver, I should be a good obeyer, if you would. And today, as we look at that, I want you to look in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to, because of the size of our text, we're just going to take off chunks as we're going through the book instead of reading through all three chapters here at once. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife of the daughter of Levi, so so that the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, and she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dubbed it with the asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done with, to him. Then, verse 5, then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and take and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, that I will give him uh, give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. Lord, help us to learn from this incredible life lesson that is to be learned from throughout the lessons, plural, from these passages that we're going to go over this morning. Lord, we see incredible faith. We see obedience in the midst 
of a pressure to conform. Go, Lord, would you please help us not to be rebellious, but help us not to be, help us to be nonconformist to sinful things. When the peer pressure is on, the fear of man, God, help us to fear you more than what man would pressure us to do that would be evil. We love you. We ask for your blessing. We help for your assistance. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, teach us this morning? Help me, guide me, and may you be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the backdrop of chapter 2, we studied last time together in, Act, in Exodus 1, verse 16 and verse 22. We saw how that the law of the land, look at verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you shall be cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. He's commanded this to everyone. It, it, the feeling is almost like, hey, you better squeal on your neighbor if they've got a baby boy whatever you do don't put the announcement out there that you get from st luke's hospital the little blue sign that says uh congratulations it's a boy don't put those signs out in this time and make sure that you don't squeal on anybody that has a boy what's that cry oh uh, that's uh yep that's a that's a noise over there <laughs> i mean mum's the word just like in World War II, how we're told that loose lips sink ships. Could you imagine how tight-lipped Israel had to be in this time? Could you imagine being the mother at this time that's trying to keep a baby for three months quiet in your little hut that you're living in? Now, as we think over the pressures that must be going on, if Pharaoh's men had heard baby Moses, they would have seized the little child as if a baby is a criminal. Isn't that sad to think of? You're an outlaw to even exist, according to Pharaoh. As if the baby were a criminal, feed him to the crocodiles. Well... You know, thousands of years, can I just say this? For thousands of years, people have been sacrificing babies. Why does that happen, though? Have you ever asked that question? You want to know why? Because in Psalm 139, the Bible says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. David describes, when I was knit in the womb, you, you put all my parts together, and your thoughts toward me are more in number He's like, and he goes in beautiful description through Psalm 139. For time's sake, I can't take you there, but you write it down. The psalm describes how precious the life of children, babies are. And yet, in back in the days throughout Israel, people worship Moloch, the God that they sacrifice babies through the fire. They put their children through the fire. They burned them up so that they could have fertile crops. But you know what? Here in North America and South America, how much of the time do we find even human sacrificing of, the, of ancient Indian peoples, uh, Aztecs and Incas and various ones around, T tons of human sacrifice. Why has that happened for thousands of years? Why has murder been such a high agenda for Satan and mankind? Because man is made in the image of God. He was made to worship God. And what is Satan's number one agenda? To rob worship from God. He doesn't want anyone to worship God. He doesn't want them to discover meaning and purpose in life as found in Jesus. The God who made you wants to know you and wants you to know him. He can't love you so much he sent his only begotten son into the world that he would die in your place for you. This is the God who is mad about those he has made in his image. Yet, what is Satan doing in his sinister and sleeky, slimy way behind the scenes? He is whispering to people, hey, if you want a better life, if you want to get ahead, you can't be, you can't be chained down to a baby. You better get rid of the child. You better discard the child. We live in a world, this is nothing new in the age we live in. This is something that has been whispered to people for thousands of years. And we understand in our culture how these things are so illustrious. They've been illustrious for thousands of years. And the person who has an abortion, we love. But we always promote life. We live in a nation with over 60-some million that have died by abortion. In China, when I was over there, 
they told us that if you, and you know they have a one child policy, you're not allowed to have two children. If you have a second child, do you know what you're, they do? They tax you extra. And not just you, everyone in the same company that you work for. So if you work for oh, Tyson or Seaboard Foods or something like that, everybody, all 3,000 plus employees or 1,600 employees here, or where, they're all going to be taxed. What's that going to do? It's going to put pressure on you to kill your child, get rid of the child. And that's what they do in China because in a Marxist communist thinking, get rid of the unnecessary. They don't believe in God. What does Marxism believe? There is no God. Communism teaches that. There's no accountability to God for getting rid of unnecessary life. That's curbed the population. All these other lies that we're told today. The pressure is on. Verses 1 through 3. Look at your Bible. A man of the house of Levi. Now, he's of the ancestry. In Middle Eastern talk, if you would, Levi has been dead and off the scene for almost 400 years. Um, he's one of the 12 children of, of, Israel, of Israel. And so, remember, they all came down. So it's not been dead for 400 years, but a little, you know, 350 years or whatever it happens to be. Levi's been dead. So why does it say this? Because he's of the lineage. He's the ancestry of Levi. And so is his wife. So 300 and some years ago, earlier, they're, they're both of the same tribe, both of the same ancestral father of Levi. And it goes on. But you know what's interesting? The name of mom and dad are never mentioned in this chapter. Verses 1 through 10 in this narrative. We don't know that it's Amram is the father and Jochebed. You have to get to chapter 6 and chapter 7 to find that out. You want to know why? God's highlighting their faith. And not putting all the emphasis on them. Because you need to discover, though God is never mentioned in these verses, God is the deliverer behind the scene. And that's what you have to study and see that, oh, it's God that's the real one behind all this deliverance. In the silence, God's active. And so look in verse 2. So the woman conceived, Jochebed, she conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, he hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him and dubbed it with asphalt and pitch and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. Let's pause there. In this passage, we see that a mom and dad have chosen to disobey the government. They're supposed to kill their son. They're slaves. At the pain of the whip, they would be whipped. They would be punished severely for what they've done. And you may ask, well, how is it that Moses has a, a sister and a brother? Well, we know sisters are protected. Aaron's three years older. So the law must went into effect early on in the, about the time G, uh, Moses is being born. That's our assumption. We don't entirely know. But today, as we think about this, I want to challenge you, Christian, to think this. Serve your deliverer, your delivering God, with obedience when it takes faith to be a nonconformist. You need to obey with obedience because it's going to take faith to be a nonconformist. You know, I can't imagine trying to uh, quiet a baby and keep... My kids weren't quiet. Were yours? <laughs> They have lungs. And we have a name in my house. They're called Woodford Lungs. They're big lungs. They, they can project. But can God protect a child? Yeah. And repeated, we see the best of their mom and dad's ability. They're trying to protect little Moses. At the same time, God is protecting too. You see, in Moses' uh, situation, he is three months old. It must be that he can no longer be con concealed. And I can't imagine all the time whispering over to Miriam, his, his older sister, shh, keep him quiet. Don't tickle him. Don't touch him. Can you imagine the conversations that Jochebed had to have with that probably Aaron, the three-year-old toddler? What do toddlers do around babies? And can you imagine? This is a hard situation. And in this situation, they're saying, we are not going to bow the knee to kill our baby. We're not going to disregard life as if it's nothing. This child was made in the image of God. And there's something special about this child. You know, now, you might laugh. Who, who wrote the book of Moses? 
Moses. He was a beautiful child. Do you think he enjoyed writing that down? I don't know. But the word beautiful here is the Hebrew word tov. And uh, it, it's used in Jewish greetings, like good morning, good evening. It, it means to be pleasant, good, favorable, beautiful. It can be translated in that whole range. And here, Moses is seen as a good child, a favorable child, a special child. He's beautiful. And in Hebrews chapter 11, 3, uh, 11, 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Isn't that awesome? Can you and I be in sticky scenarios? I'll never forget one time when I was in a restricted country and the army was clamping down and they were kicking us out of the area where we were teaching. And we were not allowed to be there and we did not know, are we getting a train anytime soon? What's gonna happen to all of us? Are we going to be, what's going on? Because one, they spoke a different language than we did and so we're very limited in our communication with the government. It was a scary time. Have you ever been in a situation where it's scary? This is a scenario that's scary. And yet, what did they do? They did not fear the king. My friend, there may be a day where you can't fear the United States government in some area of disobedience. Now, we fear God and honor the king. Is that what we're commanded to do? Only if they're commanding us to disobey God do we objectively disobey. Our allegiance is to Christ first. But don't make up false arguments that you're this pious person. If, if other Christians couldn't agree with you from the Bible, then don't go rogue. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't become some vigilante crazy person. You obey, you honor the government, fear God, honor the king. That's what the command is. But if they command disobedience, like in the case of Moses, they command the murder of a baby, you don't on your life obey them. That is where we say, no, my conviction to do right is to before God, and I will fear God more than the wrath of the king. And that's what we see in Hebrews eleven twenty three. By faith, the family builds a woven ark, if you would, a little basket of, and in spite of the most powerful king, who is trying to use fear to kill. And twice in chapter 1, verse 16 and 22, we see the command doubles down and kill these baby boys. In the midst of that pressure, and these demanding death to the babies, a deliverer will come by faith. By faith. Can you imagine this? How is this boy saved? Hebrews says, by faith he was spared, if you would. Well, as we come to this, Moses' mother could hide him no longer. She puts him in this basket-like woven, um, made of bulrushes. Our translation has, it's uh, likely papyrus. That bulrushes would be papyrus woven, if you would. You've heard of papyrus being made into paper. When I look at, it's not like cattails, but in America, that's the closest thing I can compare to. They're on long, stringy stems, and they would make baskets out of it. And you would have a fan top, kind of like a palm tree, except not one weeping palm, but a whole top of palm. And they would take the leaves and take and split the stalks, and they would make all kinds of probably things that your kids would make for if they were going to make a fort or make baskets or whatever they get into, you know? And here... I can imagine she makes this almost wicker-like basket. But you're thinking through. She's thinking through. Jacob, it's like, but if he rolls over, maybe he'll tip the basket over into the water. Could you think those sickening thoughts as a mother? And I, I could just imagine Jacob, she's like, no, no, I, I've got to line it with cloth so he can't like tip all the way over to one side and tip this thing over. She pitches it with pitch from the inside and out. The same Hebrew words are used for Noah's ark. And back in Genesis uh, 6 through, um, through 9 in that period of time when the, God flooded the world. Here, this floating bassinet. Now, I always pictured this 
And Swindoll brought it to my attention as I could just see Miriam, the little sister, the older little girl, the older sister. I always pictured it like she pushed him out. Oh, the princess is coming. I know this is about the time looking at the sun. So about the time when the princess comes out and bathes and cleans up. I would imagine they study the time, but I kind of pictured it as Miriam shoving it out gently toward the princess when she was coming. Oh, she's coming. I'm going to send it in that way. But did you check your Bible? Is that, that's what happened? It's not what happens. Something else happens. Notice that uh, in verse 3, at the end of it, it says, And laid it in the reeds by the river bank. Oh, now... Cattails, when you picture cattails, they're kind of stiff, right? I could just imagine that in the reeds, in the papyrus, this little bassinet is kind of wedged there. But you know what's going to happen? Vernon McGee puts it this way. A mother's heart and a baby's cry happens. And God uses something very special and saves that child alive. Verse 4, and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done. Could you imagine little Miriam? Is he going to make it? Is something going to get him? Will she see it? Come on, God, please, please help the princess see. And you could just hear her rooting in prayer as a little tiny girl. And can kids pray by faith? Oh, yeah. When they just believe something, they're all in for it. And you could just hear God delighting in these prayers. You get into verse um, 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she she sent her maid to get it and when she opened it she saw the child and behold the baby wept so she had compassion on him and said this is one of the Hebrew children here this child it comes to light that it's uh, or this bassinet this mystery basket is a surprise all right it's little Moses and I could just imagine all the excitement and the wonder and what do I do with a baby face to face? We see Pharaoh's daughter does not carry out the execution. Verse 22 of chapter 1 says everyone is to know this. Yet the irony is Pharaoh's daughter is going to save the man that's supposed to deliver the Israelites. In the midst of that, I want us to review for a second Jochebed the mother of Moses. Her preparing all these things, do you know what she did? She invested in her son. She did not say, I'm going to make this basket and I'm just going to shove it off into the river or throw it into the river. She didn't go down to the river singing, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Did she do that? No. Christian, if you're going to live by faith, you've got to plan things. If you're going to be doing things for God, you need to plod for God. And I challenge you from this text that we would be ones that, that think, that plod. Swindoll said that she has great faith in God, but it was not foolish faith. On the contrary, contrary she took steps to devise the very best plan she could under these terrible circumstances, leaving the ultimate results to a sovereign God. It makes you wonder, as you think about this wise mother had identified certain habits of Pharaoh's daughter. She knew uh, that at a certain place, at a certain time, the princess came to the river to bathe. As we think of this, it, you're just like, wow, she really, by faith, embraced how she could love her son, how that she could protect her son. Uh, as we think about this, we need to be ones that make sure that we don't just say, God, it's out of my hands. I can't do anything. Ah! We panic. Do you see a mother panicking here? Do you know what panic is not? Panic is not faith. And it's not faith in the deliverer. When you panic, we need to rein ourselves in and say, God, how do I trust you? How do I by faith believe you, God, more than my feelings of not knowing what to do, more than my fears of the unknown, God, I've got to trust you as more reliable than my feelings. Well, she sees the basket in verse 5, 
She sends for it. She takes this little child in, and it's going to be her own. Well, God is knitting her to this child, which is an amazing saving grace of God. Let's look on to verse 6. Well, we saw verse 6. Verse 7, And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Did, did you wonder, did Jochebed tell little Miriam? And I'm like, well, where's Jochebed? She's a slave. So is Amram. They're all slaves making bricks. They're out in the fields. This is a full-time mom, working mom, and she has faith in God. And you could just imagine this full-time working mom has probably talked to little Miriam and said, Miriam, you be prepared. Maybe, did they practice these things ahead of time? I wonder. Miriam, you wait in the bulrushes. You wait in the reeds until just at the right time. I would imagine this was, could have been role play. Look at this. This sweet little girl runs up. Verse 7. And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women that they may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Isn't this awesome? Here, God not only saves the baby, but he gives back to mom who is unknown to Pharaoh's daughter that she's the very mother of the child. And meanwhile, what's going to go on? All of a sudden, she's going to be on the government payroll. Uh, kitty cares paid for by the government. This is wild. Verse 10, And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Verse 11, now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren. So we, we have a big skip in what take, took place. If you were to study, and we don't have time to do this, but Acts chapter 7, Stephen recounts all that took place in this time. Uh, the first uh, martyr of the church, Acts 7, in his testimony, in his witness to those who are stoning him to death, he said he brought back to Moses and there's several details that we don't have in our text that fills in some of the blanks. We, we kind of assume here that until the child was weaned, that Moses' mom, Jochebed, you know, fed him, nurtured him. Can I, can I challenge you with this? Never underestimate the preschool years. Make sure you're investing in your preschoolers. They're very valuable time, teaching them right and wrong. You're equipping the conscience. Do you know why crime is so high in America? You know the number one common denominator that uh, many studies have shown? No dad in the home. Okay, no authority figure, no structure hardly. And we need to make sure. Now, if you don't have a husband, that doesn't mean your son's going to turn out like a criminal. Okay? Um, it does say that we have to fill in some blanks and it's, there's some challenges. And we see throughout the Bible, widows and widowers, various things. But you and I need to be mindful. Those preschool years are valuable times to invest in your kids. Don't just say, oh, they're just kids. Let them play all they want. No, invest in them. Get them into Kids for Truth and have them memorizing Bible verses and Bible doctrine. Have them a part of Sunday school, learning and growing so that they would, one, trust Christ as Savior, but set them on the right course um, as an age-appropriate education, that they would be able to uh, grow in those things. Well, the princess takes him in. Now, just a, just a side note, as far as the princess... We don't know entirely which princess this is. Bible Knowledge Commentary and a few other commentaries have a few uh, recommendations. But some of these pharaohs had, one I read had 162 kids. So I don't know what it all meant. But later on we're going to see that he was raised to be an, an heir, to be a prince. 
If you saw his chariot going down the road, it said Pharaoh Jr., okay? That was, that was, I know they didn't have license plates, but I'm just saying that would be his Pharaoh II or Pharaoh Jr., something of that nature. But here we need to see, we saw Jochebed walk by faith. And if you walk by faith, that doesn't mean you stop thinking. Faith does think. Faith does plan. Faith does not leave things to happenstance. Make sure you're investing as, uh, as we should. Well, we get into our next point. Number two, serve your deliver too means anticipating God's faithfulness is bigger than your failures. Bigger than your failures. <clears throat> As you look in chapter 2, verse 11, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out to the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? And he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. As we come into our passage, we see something happens in Moses where he wants to know, see his brethren. He has compassion. Notice it says he saw, verse 10, and he saw an Egyptian. The word saw is to look with compassion in the Hebrew. He looks with compassion upon his Jewish brethren. How does he know this? Because he had a mom that invested in the preschool years. She only probably had three years to invest in this little boy. And this little boy has a heart for his people. I think he even has some kind of internal longing, maybe, to be the deliverer. In fact, they're going to say, who made you a prince and a judge over us? God has been gearing this young man to be the deliverer. But do you ever get ahead of God in a way that it was your plans that you pushed and not God's timing, not his way? Well, that's where we find Moses. We find him as he sees one of the Hebrews being whipped, beaten. Verse 12, he looked this way and that way. What's, what is that? That's his conscience. He's like, is anybody looking? And he kills the Egyptian. Moses would have been trained. In fact, the Bible tells us he was learned in all the ways of the Egyptians. He would have learned warfare. He would have learned, and may you know, that Egypt was the foremost nation in the world at the time. It was the superpower of superpowers. We're, we're roughly at the time that Moses is here. Uh, so he is going to have the exodus in 1446 B.C. And so we're roughly 1500 uh, B.C. when this is taking place. And they are the superpower of the world. They're the first major power to have the type of chariots and advancing chariots throughout those centuries. They are incredible in warfare. They've had long standing different dynasties. Great powerhouse. They were also in schooling. They would be like... He would have had like an Oxford University kind of education. The foremost in the world, he's getting there. He would have learned languages, warfare, survival in the wilderness probably, all kinds of tactics of every which way. It would be like sending him to a combination of West Point and Oxford. That's the type of education that he is getting. And as I look here in verse, he kills the Egyptian. But can I remind you, your sins will find you out. Yeah, I want to be careful in what I call this. But God hasn't given him the command to do this yet. 
And I think that kind of reigns in my view of this. Verse 13, And when he went out a second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. Man, I thought nobody knew about this. But he's taking on this. He's like, hey, you guys, hey, you guys shouldn't be arguing with each other. You should knock it off. You're brethren. I mean, he's feeling this Jewish identity with his people. But you know what they're not feeling? They're not feeling any Jewish identity to this Egyptian chain, trained silver spoon in his mouth. Egyptian. You know, sometimes we rush into things and we force things. I think Moses is forcing something that was not natural yet. And we get into verse 14. Who made you a prince and judge over us? Are you going to kill us too? I mean, we know how you use wrath and anger. You know, we know that you can wield the sword. You're going to knock us off too? And then this all word gets out. Moses is, uh, he becomes very fearful in the, that now his life is in danger. Today, as we think on a little bit more, I want us to consider Acts chapter 7, verse 20 through 29. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in uh, his father's house for three months. So that, you know, before being put in the basket. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up her, as her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, your brethren, why do you do wrong to one another? We see that God is using this. What is Moses going to become? He is going to become their deliverer, but it's another 40 years away. What is he going to do for the next 40 years after that? He's going to judge between a whole nation. And is God not sharpening him for his next assignment? But you know what? There's going to be a 40-year delay. You ever had delays in your life? I'll never forget some days street witnessing or talking with some of you. I'll get questions. You guys will ask some really tough questions and I have to study and find answers in the Bible and look up resources and try to find some answers. Sometimes when witnessing to unbelievers or skeptics, you dig, you find an answer and you're all excited to give it, not only to them, but anyone else who comes along. Do you know what God uses that for? He uses that to sharpen your edge so that you could be able to share that hope in the Lord with other people down the road. How much of the time has God equipped you with experiences for his future use of you? I think that's going on here in the life of Moses. Well, in verse 27, but he, he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. Uh, we get into our uh, sub-point here. Reform is achieved through God's power, not impulsive motions. Moses jumped on the first opportunity to defend himself. First opportunity to take this into his own hands. You know what? If God hasn't sanctioned it yet, make sure that you're careful not to do the things that aren't clearly outlined from you. Now, we don't have audible voices given to us today, but we have 66 books of the Bible. You know how much, how much Bible Moses had at this time? Two books. The book of Job, the book of Genesis. You have how many books of the Bible? 66 books of the Bible. And you're like, but he had cool experiences. You know what Peter said? You have a more sure word of prophecy, more sure word of God than even the experience of me being on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
1 Peter chapter 1. We're like, but that was so cool. If I saw that, I know I would do right. Guess what? Moses is going to see a fiery burning bush, and he's going to give God a list of excuses of why he can't obey him. Folks, experience does not mean you're going to obey God. You've got to believe God's authority. That's what we've got to be stuck to. Well, next, you fail when you are a people pleaser instead of a God pleaser. Verse 12, he looked this way, he looked that way. Because nobody's looking, I can get away with what I want. None of the Egyptians are around. I'm safe with the other Jewish guy that I'm defending. Eh, no, you're not. <laughs> He's going to squeal. We need to be careful of that pull. And uh, our last, I'm just going to end with three today. Serve your deliver, trusting God knows how to prepare flawed followers. Flawed followers. Look in your Bibles there. And our text is going to be verse 16 to 22. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to the daughters, and where is he? Why is he not with you? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Let's pause for a second there. It reminds me of this silly cartoon of Mulan. Do you remember at the end of that silly cartoon how there's the grandmother and the soldier comes back to marry Mulan or whatever to talk with him and... Uh, and the grandmother's like, is there any others? <laughs> or what, however she says it. Um, and uh, one of the characters in the cartoon says to Mulan, oh, oh I know, the emperor said, you know, the, to the, not Mulan, but the, the warrior. He's like, a girl like this doesn't come along every dynasty. Um, here, you, you come along and dad's out in the fields and he's like, chivalry has died. What are you doing leaving a guy like that out in the field? Bring him out for lunch, man. Come bring him home. <laughs> so here you see that. That's my commentary. Go on, verse 21. Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses. And she bore him a son and called his name Gershom. For she said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Was God seeing the pain all along? Yes, he was. God was there. In the silence, God's preparing a man. Huh, but God's taken so long. Do you ever feel that way? He's taken too long. No, he's not ready for it. You're not ready for it. But like, I'm ready for anything. No, you're not. Knock it off. Start just being humble about God's timing. God's timing is best. And you've got to believe him as being better, being excellent, being the perfect one about timing than how capable you are. Moses thought he was capable. He thought, according to Acts, that everybody would follow him. Man, I'll just kill an Egyptian and they'll all follow me. How well did his plan work? Eh, negatory. Today, as I uh, think of some of that, you and I need to be ones that say, God, help me not to force the wrong things. I, something Swindoll said, I try, I fail. I trust he succeeds. Are you trusting the one who does succeed? Are you trusting the one who is all able? Are you clinging to him above everything else? Today, as we close today, I would like to challenge you 
Do you believe God who created everything in all its variety can use you with all your weaknesses? God's going to use you. A man who was supposed to be a prince of Egypt, who flunked out at being a deliverer, who killed a man, and God's going to greatly use him. Do you believe that God, who created all the variety in this world, can use you? You need to. You need to believe that God can do his goodwill and pleasure through you and that his thoughts toward you, just like the babies in Psalm 139, are more in number. They're innumerable. They're written down. God's plans for you are good. They're sweet. Let's pray. Lord, would you please help us as uh, we want to be men and women of faith. God, help us to trust you, our deliverer, more than everything else. May you be glorified. Lord, thank you that our weaknesses are your opportunities. As Paul would pray that and share with us that in our weaknesses, your strength is made known. Lord, help us to dis discover the richness of your strength. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week.